Growing up, um, Whitney and I were kind of like best friends. He was just really loving and supportive. He was really happy all the time. Hey, Whitney. Hey, Whitney. <laughs> he just loved exploring and adventuring and seeing new things. Everyone that came into our lives just loved him instantly. He was just so full of life and energy. First, you know, he lost his ability to travel. And then he was unable to work anymore. Stopped being able to take any photos because he couldn't set up the equipment. Then he wasn't able to get out of bed anymore. Gradually, one by one, everything got taken away. When he moved in, we knew he had something chronic. He'd say he just felt dizzy. He'd have to stay in bed. It just went downhill. He just got more and more tired, and he was going to all these different doctors, and, and we just didn't understand what it was. He got to the point where he said, I can cook my food or I can wash the dishes, but I can't do both. We thought, what a weird disease. You have no energy. This disease affects so many different systems. Uh, you know, you have cardiac involvement potentially, you have cognitive involvement. There's all, often most patients complain of brain fog and, and, and fatigue, obviously. So there's physical uh, debilitation. Uh, because they're sick so long, many patients are physically just uh, com completely um, disabled. They can't tolerate any physical activities. I just be feeling a bit like the Energizer Bunny is beginning to just get all tired. Mm -hmm. I had gone on vacation to Incline Village up in Lake Tahoe and I came back and came down with a flu. Immediately knew there was something different and the different was the level of fatigue. Like a fatigue you've never felt before. I feel like someone took my blood out and replaced it with cement. The doctors at first thought it might be the mono or um, something that your body just gets over. I've described it before when I'm real bad. It's, you know when you get to that age where you realize I can't pull an all-nighter anymore <laughs> and the day after you try that last all-nighter, it feels like every day is sort of a recovery. So I got, I've got three medications here. Two of them came in pumps and one of them didn't. Can you send a pump, like, overnight or something? Whatever you need to do, I just need to have it because he's starting to have to throw up every day and that's gonna possibly actually be a fatal thing for him because he, it, it depletes his energy so much to be doing that. Whitney is very severe. He's about as bad as that you can, you can get with this disease. I mean, he's now, you could say like borderline comatose lying in bed. He can't communicate, he's awake, but that's about it. He's just lying there. Uh, he can't eat or drink or anything. He can't tolerate very much light or noise. Basically, he's in solitary confinement. I mean, he has no interactions. He's still there, but you can't, it's hard to see it. Neurologically, a lot of these patients have a great sensitivity to stimulation. In some patients it manifests as light sensitivity, in some patients it manifests as sound sensitivity, and they go into sort of an overload mode very quickly. Uh, and in Whitney's case, like many other patients, that has gotten to an extreme. It's amazing that the hormones, you know, obviously are regulating, you know. All of your senses are so heightened. You just want to scream out, don't make noise. Don't touch me. Don't be in the room with me. It's a sensory overload, but you desperately do not want to be left alone. I had to restructure my outlook of myself because so much of the activities I thought made me me are now off limits. 
I struggled to feel like I could fit in people's lives. All these friends who I know care about me and show me that they care about me offer to hang out or go out of their way for me. And for me to know that the right move for me and my health is to turn that down as often as I actually need to is frustrating. I feel desperate for that social interaction. You have to struggle with that feeling of abandonment and you know that they're not abandoning you. It can be easy to get lost inside yourself, to feel so isolated. You can definitely feel like you're in a box and <laughs> you're watching other people live the life that you thought you were expecting to have. It's so, so lonely that you're not interacting with the world. And I think that's the part where it takes you mentally. It's just stripping away your humanity. There's kind of a, a daily moment where I have a little bit of a, a breakdown. It happens every day where I'm, you know, I realize that he's not here and I can't talk to him. And I don't think I'll ever experience anything more difficult. And I think it would be difficult to grieve his loss if he died, but I think it's a very different kind of loss and grief that I go through every day of having him still here and have no idea what's wrong with him. I have no control over it, I can't make him better, and I'm just stuck as this bystander sitting here watching him suffer and watch his life pass him by. It's like there's a big hole like right there all the time. And it's just a never-ending nightmare of getting worse and worse and worse and just losing him. I miss him so much. I used to help a lot more with his care than I do now. Seeing him like that every single day was, too, I think, too much for me. I can't imagine how strong they have to be to see their son like that and face it and do it every single day. It's constant, unrelenting, because they're taking care of him all day and all night, and it never really ends. We don't go anywhere. We don't take vacations. And my wife is housebound. It's just so stressful. I mean, what is worse for a mother? I just. I can't make him better. I can't. All I can do is do everything I can to help him be more comfortable, but he's still just suffering so much. I can barely stand it. I mean, sometimes I just start crying uncontrollably. I don't want to lose him. I want him to have the whole rest of his life. It's very hard for both of us. The other thing we've sort of noticed is that to a large extent, we've lost all our friends because what are we going to do? They invite us to dinner? Well, we can't go to dinner tonight. I was expanding my practice and going to be a full-time psychologist. I really miss all the parts of my life that I don't have anymore. It's a really terrible disease. It robs people of their life. and It robs their caregivers of their lives, too. The other problem the disease has is they don't look sick. Um, and that affects doctors and it affects the public as well. Almost half the people I talk to and they talk, ask about my son and they said, oh yeah, I had that once, which is totally incorrect. They couldn't possibly have. I had a, a neighbor say to me recently, sometimes you just have to push yourself. I'll make you feel better. And I went, I understand exactly what you're saying and you're right. When you have other illnesses that will help you feel better, it is truly something that you've never felt before. With such general symptoms, particularly the fatigue part, it's gotten this stigma over the years that it's not a real condition. Uh, and that's uh, actually, I think, one of the biggest problems. Many of them are told that they're crazy, they're lazy, uh, they're depressed, um, when in fact they have real, real complaints. Most patients will see about 20 physicians before they're diagnosed. Uh, with ME-CFS. I think chronic fatigue is probably the last major disease we don't know anything about. 
it's unlikely my son's going to get better unless I figure something out. And so I feel a lot of weight that I, I have to figure it out. And, I'm, and it's really hard to figure that out. Uh -huh. These are the five controls. Uh -huh. And this one is a real outlier. What we have to do is look at the severe patients. The severe patients will have the largest signal as to what's wrong. But they're not going to come to the clinic. We have to go to them. That really is the key. You know, we need to get better data, more data, and more research done in, in, in this uh, condition and, and, and associated conditions uh, than ever before. We need a tremendous uptick in, in the funding. That funding has to come from the, from the private sector, which is difficult, or it has to come from NIH, which is probably more difficult. <laughs> I think that's something that we, we have as American citizens to have an obligation to all our citizens. And the ones that are suffering, uh, they need some hope.